There's a great watch for every budget, and when I say every budget, I mean every budget. Starting at $10 all the way up to a million dollars, I'm going to take a look at 15 different watches that are my favourite for every price. The last one is going to blow your mind. Let's get things started with just $10. $10 used to be a decent amount, but these days it'll barely cover the tip for the latte frappe mocha, let alone the beverage itself. And that makes sourcing a watch I could even stomach wearing, let alone call my favourite, very hard indeed. Thankfully makers of all things calculator and piano, Casio, are here to save this whole video concept before it immediately dies on its butt and makes me look stupid. This is the MQ24 7BLL. Better known as the cheapest watch you can get without worrying that you've just inadvertently funded human trafficking. It's cheaper even than the venerable F91W, which just pips our $10 budget by a healthy topping of cream and sprinkles. The MQ Blah Blah is made of resin, is powered by quartz and is mildly water resistant, so it'll go anywhere, do anything and never give you grief. It also doesn't look like a complete piece of crap which is nice. It doesn't glow in the dark, however, so should you be running short on electricity, you might have to wait until morning to know what time it is. Complaining about this watch really is like complaining that air is boring and water is bland. It doesn't get any more fundamental than this, and really anything else from here on out is merely optional. If you just want a device on your wrist that tells the time without leaving a stain, this here's your winner. $50. If your criteria are a little more fancy pants than that, however, then I might recommend you look at a Casio instead. Yes, for our $50 spend we stay with the good old manufacturer of the DZC100 colposcopy camera. We're trading resin, however, for questionable materials that at least look like steel. Casio are willing to commit to the bracelet being made of steel, but the case, not so much. In any case, <laughs> it looks at least five times nicer than the MQ Blah Blah, which is handy because that's exactly how much more it costs. There are a variety of colours, with the most popular of course being a shade somewhere between Sharon Green and Ursula Violet. Believe it or not, this cheap $50 watch, at the height of its fame, was trading hands for ten times the price. I've heard more convincing proposals at the annual Flat Earth convention. Still, for $50 there's not a whole lot else you're going to find that looks like everybody favourite watch, the Belova Super Seville. It even gets a generous helping of luminous paint on the hands, so Betty buys need no longer be fraught with time-based anxiety. It even gets a date too, which apparently some people can't live without for reasons that are beyond me. Yes, the MTP1302PD2A2VEF is without doubt my recommendation at $50. Tell all your friends. $100. Okay, so now we're talking about amounts of money that actually sound serious and not like a takeaway bill, and with it comes a watch that looks a bit serious. Serious too, the Timex Standard. As the name suggests, this watch isn't extra. It's about as basic as they come. It's so lacking in anything that they couldn't even be bothered to give it a proper name. It's the watch equivalent of calling your eldest child first. That explains a lot of those YouTube comments at least. Before we talk about what's good with the Timex Standard, let's address what's substandard. We still haven't been able to upgrade ourselves to real steel yet, and so we're looking at chrome-plated low-lead brass. It's a shame because there are other watches at this price point that are made of stainless steel, but really the likelihood of seeing the plating wear off is only going to be a problem for first when you hand the watch down to him on your deathbed. Kid just can't catch a break. What's super standard about this Timex, however, is the way it looks, very much inspired by the Broad Arrow Omegas of the late 1950s and especially the Railmaster. We had mastered the skies, we had mastered the seas, and that left the most dangerous natural foe of all, the 715 from Bromley South to London Victoria. It would take a stronger man than I to brave such an inhospitable environment. The Broad Arrow design is expressed chiefly in the broad arrow like our hand, but also carried through from the Railmaster the other hands, the hour markers, and the minute markers too. Well, everything really. Where we deviate is with the deliciously low lead case, which apes earlier watches from the 1920s instead. It's quartz, gets 50 meters of water resistance, and has a mineral glass crystal. Standard. 
$500. Okay, so now with $500, we're starting to spend the kind of money you need spousal permission for. And when it comes to the eye of Susan, it's probably a good idea not to muck about. $500 starts to open up a good selection of watches, some more flamboyant than others, but really my favorite at this level has got to be the least flamboyant of all, the Seiko SRPE93K1, also known as the Turtle. Now, aside from the fact that I simply cannot separate in my mind the word turtle from a desperate car ride home after a long visit to a Lebanese restaurant, Seiko's association with said oceanic creature is far less frantic. If anything, it's as cool as a sea cucumber, because when you're maxing out its 200 meter diving capabilities, the last thing you want is to be panicked. Conforming to ISO standards for dive watches, it's got everything you need to stay safe watching documentaries about diving on telly. There's the unidirectional dive time bezel divided into 60 minutes with a luminous pip, luminous hands and markers that must still be readable after 180 minutes, mild anti-magnetism, and of course, it has to withstand getting wet. It actually has to be capable of 25% more than the stated pressure. A first for us here, however, is the inclusion of an automatic movement instead of a quartz, the Caliber 4R36. Now the accuracy may be worse than the delay to the 715 from Bromley South to London Victoria, but it at least comes with hacking and hand winding, plus a 40 hour power reserve. That's all actually worse than even the $10 Casio, but try not to think about it too much. $1,000 getting serious when you start throwing around a thousand dollars for a watch, so I had to think long and hard about this one. Actually, I didn't, because I know exactly what watch I like best at that budget because I have one. It's the, don't groan, Christopher Ward the 12. I said don't groan. There are two types of people in this world. People who've not yet seen a the 12 in person, and those who have. Take the ones who have, and you can split them again into two further groups, those who've bought one, and those who are still saving. If I meet someone and I'm wearing mine, there's always a question and then a follow-up. Is it as good as they say it is? And then, do they take credit cards? Unfortunately, they do, and now I have one, and my wife has one, and now she wants another one because they released a purple one, and she likes purple. And she's right to. It's purple. It's also about as much as you could humanly hope to get from a watch in stainless steel on rubber for less than a thousand dollars. I'm already an uber wiener for the mad styling of 70s watches and always have been, which makes me generally resentful that now everyone else is too. I'm not trying to be a hipster, I just don't have the lensless glasses for it. I just simply can't stretch to the classics anymore. I can, however, afford a The 12, and it is remarkable just how much of the same experience it offers. It's slim, less than a centimeter, has more facets than a character played by Daniel Day-Lewis, and it's executed so precisely they should be consulting for the Alabama. Alabama penal system. $2,000. Upon initial inspection, spending $2,000 on a watch that doesn't look all too dissimilar to our low lead brass friend a few price brackets ago seems like a mistake. They can't even get the numbers to match. Well, first, we'll surely be grateful to receive this heirloom once he pries it from your cold, dead hands, because this is the Nomos Club Campus 38, and it just might offer the sweetest of sweet spots in balancing watchmaking and cost. As well as the 38mm case, at just 8.5mm thick no less, being crafted from a material that won't eventually be outlawed by the EU, it's also fashioned with a level of finesse that really doesn't belong below $5,000. That's a theme here, because every aspect of the club campus is staggeringly impressive, even if the name does sound like the next National Lampoon caper. It's not a complex watch by any means, but what's so remarkable is just how much effort goes into the detail that's there. The printed markers are framed in a complementary colour that's so subtle you can barely even see it. The finish of details like the print and the hands and the subdial are so crisp it almost looks like CGI. What elevates the watch higher than a tourist in a Dubai mega tower is the movement, the Calibre Alpha. It's built in-house by Nomos, and although it looks deceptively simple with its manual winding and 43-hour power reserve, it's a well-finished and unique addition that really has no competition at the price. Only downside is, to keep the watch below $2,000, you have to forgo the clear caseback option. Life giveth and life taketh away. $3,000. If I were to say to you that the watch that comes first for me at $3,000 went back a step to quartz, you'd be quite right in calling me an ambulance, because I'd probably be having a stroke. 
Well, I would be. Were that watch not the Grand Seiko SBGP-013? The SBGP-013 is like for going a starter and dessert so you can go all in on the fillet steak, and whilst I wouldn't recommend eating this particular Grand Seiko, it is well worth the effort of changing a battery every few years. This simple watch, adorned with a blue sunburst dial, exhibits some of the finest examples of precision finishing available in watchmaking, period. I don't know how they do it, but Grand Seiko seem to have put all their XP into dial manufacture, because even at the most invasive of close-ups, the quality doesn't fade. It's a phenomenon best exemplified by the hands and markers, which are cut so clean and sharp you'd think it was a low-poly render. The flat, ripple-free polish is signature Grand Seiko, and set against the deep blue backdrop, look like two gleaming battleships about to wage war against a fleet of shiny pirates. Look at me, they say. I am the captain now. Outwardly, the rest of the case is pretty straightforward, and the bracelet is fine so long as you stay in a temperature-controlled environment. The real letdown is not being able to see the Calibre 9 F85, because even though that sounds as appealing as ham-flavoured milk, it's actually a really nice-looking thing. In any case, your attention will be distracted by the dial, which is just about as good as it gets at any price. $5,000. Right, you're really going to hate me for this next one, but here it is anyway. My favourite watch under $5,000 is another Christopher Ward, and yes, you guessed it, it's the Bel Canto. But before you learn coding just to hack into the YouTube servers and delete my channel, hear me out. Before it even existed, this is literally what I would have described if you'd asked me to paint my perfect watch. That would have been a watch with the looks of MBNF's Legacy series, with a complication that borrows from the best, with a price that makes even the bargainous Black Bay 58 look like it's being greedy. Two years ago, you'd have told me I was asking too much. Turns out, it was entirely feasible. I don't know if the people at Christopher Ward sold their souls to the devil or what, but nevertheless, here we are, with an award-winning chiming watch that makes Henry Cavill look like all the other British actors. It's like buying from Wish, except the product actually turns out to be exactly what was advertised. So nothing like buying from Wish. People say to me that I'm obsessed with this watch, and that I should probably give it a rest, and that now's not a good time to talk about the watch because the vicar is trying to give the eulogy, but I don't care. It really is that one moment in life where something that seems too good to be true is exactly that and more. My only wish is that I could trade that moment with my good friend, the Nigerian Prince. $7,000. From complex and interesting to the Rolex Oyster Perpetual, I give literally the most boring answer to the question, which watch should I get for $7,000? Yes, there are other choices, and many of them are ostensibly better, but no matter how hard I try, I keep coming back to the Oyster Perpetual like it's giving out cheese samples. I first realised the Oyster Perpetual was my favourite watch at this price when my wife got one and I didn't. Call it cognitive dissonance, call it petty jealousy if you must, all I know is that it quickly became apparent that she had a better watch than me. Maybe it's the watch, maybe it's her, but it just looks so good on her wrist. If the Casio MQ blah blah is the essence of watch as an ore, then the Oyster Perpetual is its purest form. It takes time and money to extract what is essentially the same thing, but it's absolutely worth it. If anything, for the feeling. There's no point pretending otherwise. Wearing a Rolex makes you feel like you could go to your high school reunion and tell your teacher that you actually will amount to something. You'll show them the watch, they'll fall to their knees begging for forgiveness and then everyone will clap. At least, that's how it makes you feel. It's also a good watch too. The case is lovely. The bracelet is lovely. The clasp is lovely. The dial is also lovely too, and so is the movement, which is lovely. It's just a lovely watch, and I need to figure out a way to relieve my wife of it. $10,000. It's in producing a list like this that one begins to draw some realisations about oneself. For example, I have deduced that I am indeed a boring person. My favourite colour is grey, my favourite flavour is plain, and for $10,000 my favourite watch is the Omega Speedmaster Professional, the Moonwatch. It's just hard to argue with the facts. It's better looking than I'll ever be. It's achieved more than I'll ever achieve, and as for its professionalism, well I barely even know how to spell the word. It's the A-grade student, the head of the football team, and prom king all rolled into one, and by wearing it, I hope some of that rubs off onto me. I am torn, however, because I do like it warm up front and cool round the back, and Omega won't do that for me. So I'd settle on the Sapphire Sandwich just to be able to see that hand-wound Calibre 3861 chronograph through the case back. 
For me, having a 3861 and not looking at it is like those lunatics that get F1 hospitality and watch the race on the TV. It's not just the best watch at $10,000, it's arguably the best watch ever made. But don't let that worry you because that's not how this works. You can't just skip straight to the best watch ever made and think you can get away with not buying anything else. Because just being the best doesn't make it the one you want most. If you can figure out why, you'll be the richest person alive. $20,000. Speaking of which, if I had $20,000 to spend on a watch, do you know what I'd buy? No, not that. Not that either, although that's a good shout. I'd get the Rolex Daytona. I know. Disappointing, isn't it? Any shred of reputation I had left has just turned to finest dog shit, and do you know what? That's fine. These are my favourites after all, and all I can do is listen to my heart. My first experience with a Daytona in this place outside of YouTube I like to call the real world was when I was being rolled into theatre on a gurney. The anesthesiologist was wearing one with the steel bezel. This was before the ceramic version. And I told him I liked it. He looked at me weird and then put me to sleep. I never saw him or the watch again. That moment stuck with me. Not because now I beep when I go through the metal detector at the airport, but because of how clean and classic the Daytona looked. I'm used to the idea that it's a crazy hard to get hype piece because of all the attention it gets, and yet every time I see one in person, I'm surprised by just how subtle and refined it is. It very much fits my standard criteria of being pretty boring. It's just somehow also the most popular watch in the world. You can't explain that. I like to think that if I had a Daytona, I'd never wear any other watch again, but I think that's just my brain trying to trick me into justifying the cost. And ultimately, that cost only fits into our $20,000 budget if you can buy it at RRP, which is as likely as me being invited to be a judge at the GPHG. Not just because they have no clue I even exist, but because I was banned from international competition after I tried entering Boston Dynamics into Crufts. $50,000. In some attempt to prove to you that I'm not entirely dull, for our $50,000 spend I'm going to submit a favourite of mine that's not only comfortably under budget, but also slicker than a stoat on a surfboard. The H Moser & C Streamliner Small Seconds Blue Enamel. The only thing about this watch that doesn't live up to the Streamliner name is, well, its name, which uses words like a Chinese takeaway uses packaging. As well as looking like Iron Man's wrist armour, it's also one of the most comfortable bracelet watches I've ever tried. It's like getting a wrist massage from a tiny armadillo. But my favourite thing about this streamliner in particular is the dial. Because you're not just getting one fancy watchmaking technique, you're getting all of them. It's textured, fumade and enamelled, which I imagine is really annoying to make. Looks cool though. My favourite thing about this one is that it's also a little smaller than the other streamliners. Not that they wore big, but this one was paying attention during the story of the burglar that raided a young family's home and tried to invoke squatters rights. You know, Goldilocks and the three bears. This watch is just right. $100,000. So even though the Christopher Ward Bell Canto isn't the MBNF Legacy Machine LM101 from Wish, if I had $100,000 to spend, unfortunately it wouldn't be getting the wrist time anymore, because the actual MBNF Legacy Machine LM101 would instead. If the Moonwatch is the greatest watch ever, I think the LM101 just might be the best example of watchmaking itself, combining design with imagination, tradition and skill to summarise horology in the most succinct way possible as simply, I want it, but I can't have it. From a timekeeping perspective, it may be as easy to read as a hotel bible, but that's a fine sacrifice to make for everything else on offer. From the rear, it's a classical rendition of the finest watchmaking, developed in collaboration with Kari Vutalainen, legend, and is about as visually perfect as watchmaking can get. With one exception, because you'll notice something's missing, the balance wheel. That's because at the front, the balance wheel hangs from two gleaming pillars like that bit in Independence Day when the White House gets all blowed up and stuff. It's got that same dominating holy sh** factor that makes the LM101 the single coolest watch in existence, bar none. It's stupid and ridiculous, just like those cars with the supercharger poking out the hood so the driver can't see where they're going. It's the kind of stupid that makes me glad my ancestors figured it was worthwhile crawling out of the sea. $500,000. If you really want to go crazy, then why not consider spending half a million dollars on a watch? And if you're going to spend half a million dollars on a watch, such a crazy deed has to be complemented by an equally crazy watch. And the Vianney Halter Deep Space Tourbillon is exactly that. 
If you ever saw the movie Event Horizon, you'll remember that spiky ball hoop thing they had at the other end of that really long corridor, which did something techy I can't quite remember. It ended up opening a portal to hell or something inconvenient like that. When I look at the deep space tourbillon, a part of me is concerned that at 6 minutes past 6 and 6 seconds, this thing is going to open a portal into the underworld. Granted, it would only be small enough to poke a finger through to feel the brimstone and pitchforks, but still pretty terrifying. At the heart of the deep space tourbillon is, unsurprisingly, a tourbillon, but this is no ordinary tourbillon. Where your average, boring, stupid tourbillon has consigned itself to rotating on just one axis like an idiot, this one rotates about three axes to make sure the balance gets well and truly dizzy. It's basically like one of those devices they use to see if test pilots are hardcore enough, but for watches. Then you've got the hour and minute hands reaching from the outside in, which makes the watch look a little bit like the space station from Deep Space Nine. But instead of dealing with intergalactic trade and diplomacy, it tells you when it's dinner time. One million dollars. Who knew it was even possible to spend a million dollars on a watch, but you can. This is the Grubel Forsey, or as my spellcheck insists on calling it, Grumble Forest Handmade One. Do you want to know the craziest thing about this million dollar watch? It has literally zero complications. Not even a centre seconds. Yes, there's a tourbillon, but that's not strictly a complication. It's probably better characterised from a watchmaker's point of view as an inconvenience. So why is this watch so damned expensive? You could go out there right now and buy 30 Daytoners instead, and not even at RRP. What you do with them all, I don't really know. Start a shop, I guess. No, what makes the Grumble Forest handmade one so incredible and so incredibly expensive is that it is made entirely by hand. No, this isn't to save on costs since the price of electricity went up, it's to preserve the skills of old needed to build a watch. Today, EDM and CNC and all the other acronyms mean that virtually every component in a watch can be churned out by a machine. Multi-axis milling machines can take a CAD file, carve out a piece and even finish it to a completed standard without a single watchmaker so much as tickling it. It's the unspoken truth in watchmaking today, with even the assembly, the part still weighted most towards human interaction, being shared by machines. Not the handmade one. There's tools involved for sure, it wasn't whittled from pieces of wood, but these tools are simple, one-dimensional things like belt grinders and lathes. There's no precision automated machining here. Every part is made in a way that is entirely achievable in the average shed. The big differential is the skill and the time. It takes so long to make one of these. One single screw, from raw stock to final finish, takes eight whole hours. That's a working day for one screw. Every hole for every jewel and every pivot needs to be drilled from the bridges by hand with tolerances of less than 2.5 microns. You can't just rush that and hope that filler will take care of the mistakes. Imagine cutting, shaping and drilling the base plate only to make a seismic mistake during the finishing phase. I've never seen a watch make a rage quit, but I bet that would do it. In total, one of these watches takes 6,000 hours to make, which, even ignoring the margin, puts that labour at $160 per hour. That almost sounds like a bargain. The guy who comes round to badly drill holes in my house and fixes them later with filler charges more than that. Those are my favourite watches for each price point. Why don't you let me know how wrong I am down in the comments below. And whilst you're down there, please consider supporting my channel by picking up some merch from my store. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to use lots of business jargon in meetings so people know how smart you are. Goodbye.